Hey RCC, it's Mike, and thanks once again for inviting me into your homes or wherever you're listening or watching today. It's an honor to be with you, and it's kind of a special day to be with you because we celebrate an anniversary for our church this week. We are now 18 years old as a church family, and, and for me that's amazing to still be here after 18 years is, is just kind of crazy. It doesn't really happen. Um, you guys have treated me so well over the years. All these years you've treated my family so well. I thank you for that. I thank you for making this a special place to be for my entire career. I appreciate it. You guys are an amazing church. And in, in just a second, we're going to pray and, and thank God for blessing our church as abundantly as he has. But before I do that, I want to point out one more thing. On our, on our 18th birthday, we're birthing another church today. This is the third time we've done this. Um, the, the other two were years ago, and, and today... Centerpoint Church in Fond du Lac launches. So congratulations, Centerpoint. As a RCC church family member, you should be excited. We've given birth to a whole nother church. Pastor Aaron, who was on staff with us for eight or nine years, whatever, left recently to go start this church with our blessing, with our help. We're so excited to be part of it. So um, I would like to have you pray with me, not only to thank God for blessing RCC, but also that he would bless Centerpoint as he's blessed RCC. So please, just for a moment, pray with me as we begin. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for 18 years of blessings here at RCC. You've been amazing. Thank you for loving us so much and, and blessing us so much and accomplishing so much through us here. Lord, we truly appreciate being part of your family and serving you here at RCC. God, we also ask then that you would bless Centerpoint Church in Fond du Lac. P bless Pastor Aaron um, and all of his efforts there. Bless his wife, Sydney. And in the entire church family that they're growing, God, please, Lord, accomplish amazing things through them in Fond du Lac. Help them to feel your blessing, God, and help those that attend Centerpoint come to know you in a powerful way. I pray all this in Jesus' name. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, like I said, it's a, it's a big week kind of for our church. Not only do we celebrate anniversary, but we celebrate birth today. And it's also week two in our Joy series. It's our latest series as a church. And my question to begin is this. Do you want more joy in your life? Do you want more joy in your life? Now, to begin, I thought, because we're talking about joy, it'd be fun to maybe do a little something fun. So I, I like music a lot. You probably know that by now. And I have this song that, that relates to joy that I'm going to play. I think it's an 80s song. It's super old. I'm just going to play 20 seconds. But if you're listening or watching live online right now, you have a chance to win a prize. So the first person to respond live, if you're watching live, with the name of the band who sings this song, you're going to win a prize. I'll tell you what it is in a few minutes. It's a great prize, though. You're going to want it. So please respond live if you can. Listen to the song for 20 seconds. If you know the name of the band, go ahead and put it in the comments now. Go ahead. Hello, you fool. I love you. Come join the joy ride. The band, here's your last chance. Type it in quick. The band, Rock Set. And I didn't look up the year. I think it's the 80s that Rock Set sang that song, all about joy rides. And I liked that song way back then. I was young, and, and joy rides seemed like a great time. Who doesn't like a joy ride, right? Maybe it's going along the coast or going through the woods looking for animals, or there's all sorts of fun joy rides, hanging out with your friends. Everyone loves a joy ride. But I'm guessing that a lot of us in our lives, We've tried and tried, but we don't feel like we're experiencing a whole lot of joy in our lives. And certainly, your life right now probably isn't a joy ride, at least not the joy ride that you wish it was. Yet according to Scripture, when we make a choice to follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and gives us the power in our lives, in your life, in my life, gives us the power to experience joy. Here it is, right from Scripture. It's from the book of Galatians. It says, when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's a good-looking list. I want all those things, right? You probably want all those things, too. Who wouldn't want all those things? But today, we're going to keep it short, and I'm only going to talk about one. It happens to be joy, because we're in this second week of our joy series. Today, we're going to focus on joy. And again, I ask you, do you want to experience more joy in your life? My opinion, I think, I think the number one thing everyone wants in life is joy. The places we go, the things we do, how we spend our money, all of our big dreams, all basically have the same thing in common. We want more joy. We want to experience joy. And we go about it 
in lots of different ways, in, in lots of ways to find joy. But the problem is, too often we equate happiness with joy, or we confuse happiness with joy. And there's a big difference. They're not the same thing. Think, think about it with me. If I, were to, if I were to take out $10 from my wallet right now, and by the way, whoever responded first with Roxette, this will be your prize. I'll mail it to you this week. So you won 10 bucks. Way to go. And if I said this was your prize, 10 bucks, you'd be happy for a few minutes. Like, yay, 10 bucks. That's great. I can, I don't know, buy a couple hamburgers. That'd be awesome. If I made the prize 100 bucks, you'd be happier even longer. If I made the prize a thousand bucks, you'd be happy even longer, right? The bigger the prize, the happier you'd be. It being warm outside, I wish, right? Or, or your team won. Or, or, or finding the perfect dress on sale, double cheeseburgers, catching a big fish. Someone gave you flowers, even pie. All those things bring me happiness, not joy. Even the dress, it's finding the perfect dress on sale makes me happy. And you're thinking, oh no, Mike, what are you saying? Well, Sometimes Jan and I, we go shopping together, and, and it's fun to pick an outfit out for her. And if I pick an outfit out for her that she likes, that's a good thing. If it's on sale, even better, right? It, it makes me happy. It makes her happy. Everybody's happy up for a nice dress on sale. But they're all temporary. All those things are temporary. Minutes later, you receive some bad news. They're out of her size. Oh, no. It's not that great anymore. No one's happy. And you're in your happiness scale tips, and it's over. You're not happy anymore. Happy versus unhappy changes day by day, even minute by minute for us. That's just what happens. Happiness is based on our circumstances, and when those circumstances change, we're not happy anymore. Joy is different. Joy is different. Happiness is external. Joy is internal. Happiness is good, but joy is better. This Tuesday, we we hit this cold spell here, here in Ripon, right? And it's funny, because I came into church, came into my office, and Kathy Rowland, who, who works here at church, um, was talking about how she had to change her air conditioning to heat. And it's funny, she was talking to another staff member, and I overheard it, and I was like, I did the same thing. Like, I literally went to the thermostat, and it was on cool for air conditioning, and it was so cold in the house, I had to turn it from cool, passed off, over to heat. Life in Wisconsin, right? One day it's air conditioning, the next day it's heat. But I got thinking about it when she started talking about it, and she was so right. She said, a thermometer changes with the temperature in a room, right? When it's hot, the thermometer goes up. When it's cold, the thermometer goes down. A thermostat's different. A thermostat can change the temperature in the room to improve the feeling. Thermostats change feelings. Happiness is a thermometer. It goes up and down with what's ever happening around it. Joy is a thermostat. Joy is a thermostat. You can set a joy thermostat in your life, even in the midst of unhappy circumstances or temperatures. You can set the thermostat of joy in your own life. Now, I'm sure it wouldn't surprise you if you've been going to church for a while, any good church, uh, you would probably not be surprised to hear me say that if you're a Christian person, you're supposed to be joyful, right? Churches everywhere, good churches everywhere talk about that. You've probably heard it before. Yet maybe you struggle with it. Maybe you've heard you're supposed to be joyful, but, but you struggle with having joy, and then sometimes you can feel guilty. Like, I know I'm supposed to feel joyful, but I don't. I have all these things in life, and they're bringing me down, and I don't have joy. And you're, you're, you're thinking, I'm just not there. I'm just not there. Maybe, maybe you even pretend sometimes. Maybe. Do you do that? Do you pretend sometimes that you have life more together than you really do? Kind of faking it just because you think other people do? or that you're full of joy because you think others have joy, and I'm a Christian, so I'm supposed to have joy too. And you kind of fake it, you know, out in public. You put on the, the face, and you sort of pretend. Not, not in an evil way, but you're just trying to measure up. At RCC. Here at RCC, you don't got to pretend. You don't got to pretend about anything here. You don't have to pretend you have things all figured out in life. No one has things all figured out in life. And you certainly shouldn't be comparing yourself to anybody else. Not at all. Because comparison kills joy. There's a, there's a famous quote from Teddy Roosevelt. He said, comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. I believe that's true. One, one thing that's out there a lot, statistics that are out there a lot, is, is um, people's time on Facebook. Facebook is very, very popular. People spend a lot of time on Facebook. But studies show that the more time you spend on Facebook, the less joy that you have. And it's all about comparison. You see your friends going off on trips, or you see a picture of their giant hamburger they had on Friday night, and you had leftovers at home, and, and you're always comparing. 
you're not trying to compare, but you just see all these things, and you just sort of accidentally compare your life to theirs, and it ends up bringing you down. You went to Facebook to have a good time, to, to have some fun, and later you feel bad. Your life doesn't measure up. It's very common if you've experienced it. You're part of a huge crowd. That's what statistics say. So, don't look at others. Don't look at others to find your joy. That just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's never worked. Don't do that. Instead, let's do you. Let's just do you, and instead of looking at others, let's look to God instead. If we want to find joy, if we want to know how to live, let's look to God for that, because the Bible says God is a God of joy. It's in Psalm 43, 4. Not Teddy Roosevelt. He's not in the Bible. In Psalm 43, 4, it says, the source of all my joy. This is David writing about God, and he says that God is the source of joy. God is a God of joy. So again, I ask you, would you like to experience more joy in your life? Do you want more joy? I think it's the third or fourth time I've asked you that now. Well, how about this? Since God designed life, since God invented joy, since God designed you, shouldn't you begin with God when you're looking for joy? Doesn't he know more about it, you and joy than anything else? Could you possibly begin to find joy by starting more and more to value the things God values, starting with his word and his teaching and then all the way through our actions and how we live? I want to use the the letters from the word joy today to help you remember this. I have three things that I think could really help you, and I'm going to use the letters from joy to help you remember what these three things are so it makes a difference for you on Monday and Tuesday and Friday every day, not just Sunday. I believe if you do these three things, you won't be looking for more happiness. You'll be building more God-blessed joy in your life, more real joy. The first thing is this, the J in joy, stands for jettisoning, jettison all regrets about your past. Jettison. Jettison means to throw overboard. Throw away all your regrets about your past is what I'm saying. Now, I don't know how many movies you watch. In my life, I've watched a lot of movies. And it seems like if there's a movie that involves a big boat or a, or a spaceship or a giant airplane, at some point in the movie, they're going to want to jettison some stuff. They've got to be throwing stuff overboard or whatever to keep the ship afloat. There's one, there's, a, there's an old Star Trek, the really old Star Trek episodes, where... Um, once again, the ship is going down, and you got like the main characters in Star Trek. You got like you got Captain Kirk, who who is the, the the guy in charge. I don't know if you know these old shows, but there's Captain Kirk, and then there's Spock. Spock's super smart. He's like his right hand man. And you got like the engineer down down in the ship's engine room or whatever. So whenever anything goes wrong in that show, they always call the engine room. It's, it's always kind of the same. You got Captain Kirk, and he's struggling through space somehow, and. And the actor who played him is like super overacts all the time. He's, he's really famous, way better than me, but, but he's, I, I think his acting is kind of comical. So he'll, he'll, he'll be like, um, he'll, he'll have his little like communication thing. He'll call the, the, the engine room. So I'll be like, engine room, it's Captain Kirk. We are go- about to go down. We need more power. That's kind of how he talks. And then he'll go down to the engine room, and then you got the guy who picks up the phone. He's Scotty, okay? So Scotty has this, this like Irish or something kind of accent, right? And he's like, I know, Captain. I know, but she's too heavy. She's going down. And then Spock, uh, Spock is standing next to Kirk, and Kirk will look at Spock and go, Spock, what do we do? And then Spock, who has no emotion or anything, he's just standing there like, Captain, we have to jettison the extra weight. And then they shoot everything out the torpedo tubes. It happens in Star Trek. It happens in ship movies all the time. They've got to get rid of stuff to keep the ship afloat. That's what you've got to do, too. You've got this stuff weighing you down, Get rid of it. Jettison means to abandon as worthless, to discard, to eliminate, to get rid of. God says if you want to enjoy life, there are some things you got to chuck. There are some things you got to throw overboard. There are some things you got to shoot out your torpedo tube. <laughs> You'd think after 18 years I wouldn't say stuff like that anymore. Um, in in a, like a really good church, they'd probably edit that out, but I'm not going to edit it out for you. Um, it's a little silly. But it's true. There's stuff you got to get rid of in life. you got to get rid of it. Throw it overboard. Get rid of it because it's weighing you down. And there's one particular thing in the Bible, in the book of Philippians, written by Paul that's very, very clear for us. Here it is. It's Philippians 3.13. Paul says this. No, dear brothers and sisters, I'm still not all I should be, but I'm focusing all my energies on this one thing. So maybe like you or me, right? You're not everything. Maybe you should be just yet. Neither am I. We've got some time. I'm focusing all my energies on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. That's what Paul says. Now, 
What he's saying is the first thing you have to do to find more joy in your life is to jettison your regrets. Forget, forget your mistakes. We all have them. We all have regrets from our mistakes. We've all made them. Everyone does because nobody's perfect. The only problem with regret is it doesn't work. You can't change your past. So thinking about it just makes you so miserable. A, a really popular type of TV show is makeovers. There's all kind of makeover shows. We must love them because they're all over the place. And there's, there's super common ones. There's, there's kind of a common theme. There's like the, the person makeover where, you know, they're, they're kind of more plain and they get makeup and hairdos and stuff and they look completely different. That's super common. There's, there's another type of show that's on a lot, like home makeovers. They take an old dumpy looking house and make it beautiful again. That's super common. Uh, another one is car stuff. They, they take these old cars and make it amazing. Um, and then maybe the final one is just kind of people. Like, like, you know, some dudes just need a makeover, right? And, and there's these shows, and we watch them, and, and they're good. They're kind of fun. They're, they're easy to watch. Here's the deal. It would be so dumb to go back and dig up the old clothes and put them back on or make the house look old again or re-dent up and rust up the car. That would be nuts. It'd be bonkers to do that stuff. The Bible says forget it. And, and God says in the Bible to forget it because forgetting it is good for you. He's saying it because it's good for you. He loves you. Once you forget it, you can get on with your life. And God says in the Bible, you can forget it. You have permission to forget it because he chooses to. The Bible says this in Jeremiah chapter 31 where, where God says, their sins I will remember no more. It's an amazing verse. God chooses to forget your mistakes. God, the creator of the universe, knower of all things, all powerful, all present, says, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to forget about it. I'm going to push it away so I can move on. If God can get on with it, you can get on with your life too. Let those regrets go. So, again, do you want to experience more joy in your life? The starting point is to let go of your past. The next step is to omit all worries about your future. There's our O in joy. Omit all worries about your future. If you're going to find joy in the present, you have to omit the worries you have about your future. After comparisons and regrets, worry is the greatest killjoy of them all. You simply cannot be joyful and worried at the same time. They, they just don't go together. They can't coexist. God tells us not to worry, not to be restrictive for us. God tells us not to worry for our own good because God knows worry makes life joyless. Now, I, I, I shared a whole sermon about this just a couple weeks ago, so I won't talk anymore about it right now. I'll suggest you go to YouTube, you watch it. If you haven't heard it, if you struggle with worry, I, I pray that it would be helpful to you. But the past is gone, the future's not here, and right now, I'm free of both. So what I'm choosing right now should always be joy. I'm not living in the past. I'm not living in the future. I'm living in right now. So here's how I can do this. Here's how you can do this. I have one final suggestion today. That this final practical suggestion I have for a choice that you can make today to help you feel and live a more joy-filled life is this. It's the why in joy. And the why in joy today stands for we should yield ourselves to God's present purpose. We should yield ourselves to God's purpose in our life. You have to yield. You have to give it up. Now, it it is possible. It is possible to kind of go through life on autopilot, substituting happiness for joy the entire time. Your grades are good, so life is good. Uh, You you found a new boyfriend or girlfriend, and you're so excited you want to date him for years. And you are, so life is good. Maybe uh, you're catching a lot of fish. Your golf game has improved, or tennis game, or you're running faster, and, and you're happy. Maybe your job is going well and you got a promotion or, or maybe you're rolling in dough and, and you're happy. But if you continue to substitute happiness for joy, you'll never find joy. You'll never find joy. And if you're just drifting in life, if, if you don't really know why you're here or where you're going, you're not going to have any joy in your life. You have to know these things about your life. We all need a cause greater than ourselves in which to live for. That's what brings joy. Living just for yourself, it doesn't work. It doesn't bring joy. I've been here now for 18 years at RCC, so I've got to spend a lot of time with a lot of people. And there's something I've learned that's very, very clear to me, and it's affected my life dramatically. Being more selfish equals less joy. 
It just does. That's my experience. The more selfish people I talk to, they never have any joy. The least selfish people I talk to, somehow they're full of joy. I don't even know how it works. Uh, maybe I need 18 more years for God to teach me how it works. I don't know how it works. I don't really need to know how it works. I just know that it does. I've seen it work in so many lives. This is God's design. Maybe someday I'll tell you why. I can't today, but I've seen it. It's kind of like this, again, using joy. If you have Jesus or God first, the J, Jesus first, if you have others second and yourself last, you find joy. That's what works. That's God's design. I don't know why he designed it that way. But God's designed us to put other people first. That's where you find joy. The world wants us always to put ourselves first. And you never find joy. You never do. The next thing just never brings you joy. A good example is, is Paul. Paul, who we've talked about today, who, who wrote Philippians. He had literally lost everything. He's old. He's in prison. He's in poor health. He's lonely. They tried to take everything away from him. He's in a dungeon in Rome. He had very little to be happy about. There's, there's no happiness there. But he still had joy because there was one thing they couldn't take away from Paul. His purpose in life. And, and this is what he says about joy in Philippians 4.4. 4. Always be full of joy in the Lord. All right. Just to be real, how can a person in prison write that? How can a person in prison, with everything taken away unjustly, say, always be full of joy in the Lord? The reason he could is because God, not his current circumstances, is the center of his joy. God is the center of his joy. So if you and, and, and if I want to have a joy-filled life, we need to get in line with God's purpose for our life. You, you need to make the statement where you say, God, I, I give myself to you. I want your purpose in my life more than anything else. I want you to put your purpose in my life, Lord. If you want to yield yourself to God's present purposes for you, then you need to start taking more pleasure in things that please God. That, that's what Paul does. Here's the, here's the core teaching for today. Look at this. Fix your thoughts on what's true and honorable and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. From a dude in prison. This is pure advice. I don't know where you stand with God right now or with Jesus right now, but this is, this is beautiful advice for all of us. Focus on what is true and what is honorable and what is right. It's beautiful. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are worthy of praise. How could your life not be better if you do that? Get out of the negative and into the positive. When you begin to live the purpose for which you're made, all of a sudden life just starts making more sense and you start to feel more and more real joy. Now, as I say that to you honestly, after all these years here at church, 18 years, it kind of sounds a little shallow. I feel like I'm sort of saying, go and live for God's purpose. Good grief, so what, right? Like, go and live for God's purpose. What are you supposed to do with that right now? I don't want to leave you hanging. That, that's not the type of church this is. Yes, we should go and live for God's purpose, but we should know how. We should know about our first step. So this is it. I have a first step for you today. If you really want joy, if you really want to live for God's purpose, I have a step that you can take with me today. It, it's really easy but it's dangerous. This is a dangerous step, so I warn you. If you actually choose this, you've you got to be ready for a roller coaster ride, a, a life with highs and lows and exhilarating curves and loop-de-loops that you are not controlling, that you cannot control. That's what you have to be ready for. You have to want that. And I warn you, if you prefer, you just, you'd rather remain a spectator, simply observing other people's joy. If, you, if you'd rather drive your own scooter instead of ride God's roller coaster, you don't want to do this first step with me. But if you do want more, if you do want to be in the game, not a spectator anymore, if you want real joy, then I dare you to take this first step and pray a very dangerous prayer with me today. I would love for you to say with me, God, please use me today. I would like you to say that today, and I'd like you to say that prayer every morning. When you wake up, when you get out of the shower, when you're brushing your teeth, he still knows what you're praying. Brush while you pray. It doesn't matter. But say to God every day, God, please use me today. That's a prayer of yielding to God. That's giving yourself to God every day. And then see what happens in your life. 
I dare you to do the prayer every day and then see what happens in your life if God uses you or not in purposeful, meaningful ways. I think it's the most dangerous prayer you could ever pray. I believe that because I prayed it. I prayed that prayer myself probably 25 years ago, and I, and I had no idea of the adventure I was in for. But nothing comes even close to the thrill, the thrill of being used by God. Nothing comes close. And God is looking for people who are willing to yield themselves to him. That's what they're looking for and his purpose in their life. Second Chronicles, this is my last verse for today, proves this for us. This is a powerful verse from the Old Testament. The, God says here, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. That's this yielding thing that I'm talking about. When you pray and say, God, use me. Use me today, please. You're yielding to God. You're committing to God and his purpose in your life. And scripture says that God throughout all of time is looking for people who are willing to do this. God's looking for you. God's looking for me. And all we have to say is, I'm here. I'm ready. What do you want? That's all he needs from you. You don't need to be super smart. You don't need to be super experienced. You don't need to be sin-free. You just need to say, here I am. That's it. And you can experience purpose and then joy in your life. So finally, one last time. I think it's the sixth time now, maybe. I'm not sure. If you're, if you're watching live, go ahead and comment. How many times have I asked? Do you want to experience more joy? If you do, Scripture says God wants to give it to you. It says God wants to strengthen you. You begin by jettisoning your past, get rid of it, all those bad memories, stop or omit worrying about your future, and then yield to God's purpose in your life now. If you're ready, if you're ready for more God-designed joy in your life, I'm going to ask you to pray with me as I close. Just go ahead wherever you are right now and, and bow your heads and fold your hands and I'll say the words for us. We're going to tell God that we're ready for more joy. We're going to ask him to use us today. So if you want to pray that with me, it's a dangerous prayer. It's the first time maybe you've ever prayed it. I want you to pray it every day and let, let, let right now together be the first time. Please pray. Dear Lord, Help me and help all of us, Lord. Jettison our past regrets. Just let us let them go, God, just like you do. Lord, help us omit worry about our future. Help us not to think about our future and our worries about the future. And then, God, help us to yield to your present purpose in our lives. Because, Lord, we ask you to please use us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in 2 Corinthians,